Gonna get the slides up soon, I hope. Yeah, my name is Matthias I'm from API University. API University provides resources, books, videos, courses about learning API topics, API security, API architecture, API design. Um, what we're going to talk about today is, on the one hand, of course, APIs at the API conference, and second, it's about uh, ecosystems. So APIs you're all familiar with. I like to think about um, when, I, when I talk about APIs, I like to think about API as a building block, as a Lego building block. Who here in the room liked to play with APIs when they were a kid? It's a, yeah, it's about 100%, let's say. Um, so, so many people like to play that, and I think um, that has shaped us. We, um, now we like APIs because they have some of the same properties, right? APIs can be composed in so many new ways. They can be um, put together in, in ways that you haven't thought about before. Today, um, you take the, uh, the Legos and you build a car. Tomorrow, you build a spaceship. The same thing you can do with APIs. And um, well, the second topic that I'm going to talk about is ecosystems. And you know, ecosystems, yeah, it's about plants, and it's about um, uh, plants and how they uh, interact with each other and how they live with each other. Um, what does this really have to do with APIs? We will see in a second. Because the term ecosystem actually is used in a lot of different um, ways. It's used or comes from biology, but it's also used in business and um, it's more and more used in this um, area of digital transformation and digital economy. Right. Um, this guy here can teach us a lot about what a business ecosystem is. This is Bill. Bill is a newspaper boy. And Bill figured out one very, very important thing about digital, or, well, not digital, but business ecosystems. And in business ecosystems, um, it is important to see where you place yourself in relation to other businesses. So this guy here, Bill, he figured out that if he goes to a certain spot in town in front of this department store, he can sell so many more newspapers than when he is in a residential area. No wonder, because at this spot here, there's a lot of customers coming, and all of these customers, they buy stuff, um, and on the way, they take the newspaper with them. Now, another very interesting thing happened. As soon as Bill started um, to stand there in front of this department store, the cafe down the road started to see a lot more customers. And, you know, amazingly, all of these customers, they sit there, drink their coffee, and read a newspaper. So what happened here? This is ecosystems at play. There is um, a relation between all these businesses. There's also a balance between these businesses, and they feed off of each other, just as the plants in our biological ecosystems. So let's analyze this, okay? So this is our town, um, and in this town, uh, Bill operates, and there is a customer. And this customer, he goes to town for shopping, right? Uh, and, and there, um, he goes to the department store, buys his things that he needs to have. Second step, um, Along the way, he sees this newspaper boy, buys the newspaper, and then, because you need to read the newspaper, or there's an interesting headline in there, he wants to sit down and read this newspaper right away, and nothing's more um, thrilling than read the newspaper in a cafe and also enjoy some coffee at the same time. So, there's a couple of businesses involved. There is the store, right, the department store that initially draws the customers in, then there's the newspaper boy, which kind of um, influences how customers behave in this ecosystem. And then there's the cafe, which kind of is a free rider, but probably down the line, if we would analyze this more, there would be um, other effects of that as well. So that's a business ecosystem. And important thing here is that we have a customer journey. Now, this customer really was walking, but we can also think about um, customer journeys online, like digital digital customer journeys. So this was a kind of historic example of a business ecosystem. Do we have ecosystems today as well? What could that be? Well, this is a modern town. Okay, so in this modern town, um, someone wants to buy a, t a car. Is it enough to just buy a car? Can you just uh, 
buy the car, turn on the ignition and go. Nah, usually not. I, I don't know how it is in France, but um, in, in other countries, you, you have to do a lot of other things, right? You have to, um, first you have, of course, you have to get the financing right. Um, you, you have to show up with a pile of cash. Um, you have to get an insurance first, and then you have to apply for a license plate. All of these things need to be done before you get your car. So this can be seen as a kind of ecosystem around this customer journey of buying a car. And uh, a couple of businesses are involved. Insurance company, the car manufacturer, um, the, uh, the official registration place, and a bank for financing. Now, all of these businesses are super modern and they are uh, digital, so they offer a digital process for, for getting, for example, a vehicle financing. You have to log into a website, right? And then you put your name, your address, your zip code, your city. And then um, this other, the, the car manufacturer is also online, right? He has, a, he has a tool for configuring your car. So you put in your name, your address, your zip code, and your city. And then you go to the insurance company, and they're also modern and digital and so on. They also have a form you need to put this stuff in. Uh, and then you go to the registration place, and you also have to do it there. Is this customer friendly? Not really, right? I mean, this reminds me a lot of um, Asterix and Obelix. In German, this is called Passierschein A38. Um, uh, I don't know how it's called in French, but in English. Um, it, it's this permit that they have to get, and they have to go from one place to the next place, and there's a lot of process and stuff. And they are bothered with it. They shouldn't, right? This should be super simple and easy to do that. And what would be the super simple and easy digital solution for that that really supports the customer journey? That would be, yeah, I go to my car manufacturer on the vehicle configuration page, and then there are a couple of checkboxes. There's a checkbox, yeah, I want to have financing, and I want to have the insurance that goes with that car, and yeah, give me the license plate for that, right? All this information is already in place, we can just kind of orchestrate it. And that would be our dream solution. Now, how do we get that? The first thing is, that we need to figure out what is actually the customer journey. Right? And to figure out what the customer journey is, it's a really good idea to just follow the customer. I think IKEA is it who does it, that they follow the customers around this maze that they have built up in their stores, right? And they see what the customer um, picks up and puts down, if he wants to sit down on the sofa, sits at these chairs. So they really look at how the customer behaves in their stores, and that's why the store looks um, that way, that they design it so that it's an interesting customer journey um, inside their store. The general method for this is design thinking. There's a lot of other methods that you could use, but design thinking is really the method um, that looks at the customer behavior and is very customer-centric. And the first step here in this cycle where you design um, is need finding and synthesis. So you really go in and look how customers behave. Uh, you can invite them to your own place, uh, to, to workshop, and to talk to the customers. You will always get a little bit of a different answer than if you actually look how they behave in real life. So that's the idea behind design thinking, that you check how customers actually do behave. And uh, yeah, we've done that in workshops. Um, and I think there are some guys here that are familiar with this workshops. Uh, and, and in this workshops, we actually did this um, design thinking and, and customer-centric thinking, uh, where we got not only people from the company that really wants to um, want to understand the customer journey itself, but also from businesses around them, right? Uh, and then there are different people from this company, and of course customers. Uh, here are a couple more pictures of these workshops where people are thinking and listening and observing. And out comes a so-called customer journey map. It looks like this. It's on, on the flip chart, and you have a lot of sticky notes. Maybe it looks like this. And in the end, um, you have this customer journey map. Right? Um, and I'm, I have drawn this customer journey map, um, of course, of course. But this is actually from McKinsey. So they have drawn this customer journey map for buying a car or for owning a car. So it starts with searching. 
you search for a car, um, and there's a couple of different steps involved. There's acquiring the car, a couple of different steps involved. Then you use it, you maintain it, you sell it, you collaborate. Right. So, in, um, but we will look at only the acquiring step. It's just a, it's just zooming into the second acquiring step here, so it's better readable. So you need to obtain financing, you need to obtain insurance, purchase legal, then you do a lot of registration stuff, and in the end you also have some, some services um, that you want to add to the, the whole thing. Now, you notice know, there's a couple different colors used here, and these different colors are used because there's different companies involved. Right? It's not only one company. And I think customer journeys are used today as well, but customer journeys, as we saw in this example before with these different websites are always thought of as something that we look at for one company only. Right? Customer journey for company A, customer journey for company B. But actually we want to look at uh, the customer journey from a customer perspective and that is end to end. And then we come to these customer journeys maps as we see here where different companies are involved. Right, so you don't want to do that. You don't want to just look at one one company when you design your customer journeys. That's not the right way to do it. Um, you want to really look broad when you design customer journeys. Next thing is, um, what does this have to do with APIs? Now, I've spent uh, a lot of time talking here at the API conference without using the term API. Now come the API. Um, and that's that we identify APIs based on the customer journey. Right? We don't just think of some APIs out of the wild uh, or out of the blue. We start with a customer journey. Based on this customer journey, we identify the APIs which would support each step in this customer journey. So for example, here are our APIs for the red company. It's a car manufacturer. Right? They, they would first make a customer journey map, and then they figure out, OK, these steps we can support with APIs. Right. And there they are. Then they come up with a portfolio of APIs. Next thing is uh, the bank is also involved here, identifies their APIs, and out comes a portfolio of APIs. And all the different companies involved, they create their API portfolio by looking at the customer journey map. Right, so now all the companies have, uh, have a portfolio of APIs. What are the properties of these APIs so that they work for um, an ecosystem? So we can think of APIs as internal APIs. You usually have those when you have a mobile app, right? and the mobile app is used only, um, uh, or the APIs can only be used by this mobile app, then you have internal APIs, and that's really not what works for creating ecosystems. They're locked in, right? But then you can think of as partner APIs. We already have a business relation to, to a company. For example, an insurance company has a relation to a reinsurance company. So they already have a partnership. And they can, based on that partnership, they can build APIs for creating ecosystems. This is more of a closed, closed kind of ecosystem. And then you can open up the ecosystem where you have public APIs. And those public APIs you put your API as a company in your shop window, right? You just you expose it, it's public, everyone can see it, and you want people to see it so that they can use it, come in, and, and buy something from you, actually, in the end. That's why you put them in the shop window. Good, so public APIs are also good. Um, how do these shop windows look like? You have different types of shop windows. There are what I call department stores and factory outlets. Most API portals, right, that's where you put your public APIs, are factory outlets. I have, um, if you, for example, the car manufacturer has his or um, APIs on the API portal of this car manufacturer. And the same is true for the bank and for the insurance company and so forth. And then there are um, department stores, which is like API marketplaces, and they have a selection of different APIs that they offer. So it's very colorful what they offer. They offer different types um, that maybe are also present on, um, on the factory outlet uh, API portals. 
Good. So now, um, in our process of designing really cool new user experiences, we are in the step where kind of the companies have to find their API portfolio. What's next is that the API portfolio gets used, so we build and support um, these the, uh, built actually apps that can be used. So you need to integrate all these APIs, and you need to, need to integrate them in a way, uh, or in exactly this way, as they have been identified in the customer journey. Do we want to get rid of this? Um, so, starting point for our designing the app step is looking at the customer journey. A customer journey map um, gives us a blueprint of how to build the app. And then we have our building blocks. This is the Lego that we have in our boxes. Now we need to put it into the right shape, we need to put it together in the right way. Uh, and that is uh, our starting point. That's the app that we want to start with. So now comes the fun part, right? We take, for example, this API for purchasing a vehicle. We have identified this is a step. We take this API out of the building block from the respective portal, and we put it in the right place in our app. So that's why we have this order vehicle API here. And we do it with the next API. So now we have obtaining financing. Okay, so we take the orange financing API out of the API portfolio of the bank this time, put it into our app, and so on and so forth. Car insurance API, order registration, pay vehicle tax API, and so forth. Good. And in the end, if we do this right, we come up with an app it looks like this, what we have imagined, what we wanted to have. Now the question comes, who creates this app? Because, I mean, this is all public information. And as a company who has provided this API, for example, the insurance company, does this insurance company actually care who builds this app? Because, think about it, the insurance company will actually profit from selling their insurance, not from selling their API. They will profit from the insurance. So they actually, in one way, should not care about who builds the app. They could care less. They want to sell their insurance, and that's done by someone building a cool app with their API. OK, let's return back to this uh, city that we've started with. Now, in parallel to this physical world that we've looked at, we also have a digital world. And in this digital world, all these companies that we've seen before, they kind of claim their stake. And they claim their stake in creating this app. Right? There's the insurance company and all the other companies. They say, yeah, we want to build this app. Because whoever builds the app can kind of steer the customer perception. So that's the, the downside of this, or um, that's the, oh, let's say it's the opportunity uh, in the whole thing, um, that whenever you create an app based on these APIs, you can decide that this insurance is, is used and not that, that other insurance, right, by integrating the respective API. So it's all about the competition, and this competition continues in the digital world now. So um, whoever is first in providing an API in that spot is probably in a better place to also um, steer customer perception by building that app himself or by being integrated into the respective app. That's why it's important to be first in this game, because then all the customers will go to that app because it's creating such a nice user experience. We don't have to go to Passierschein A38. It's all in this app, and they love it. And of course, there's a lot of other stakeholders besides exactly those um, that are providing the API. There's also, for example, the, um, the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples, the Facebooks, who would also like to pers uh, steer customer perception in that way. And there could also be a startup, right? So there's new, new kind of competition, and there's the old competition where an insurance goes against another insurance. So what's the business model in here? I've hinted at this before. 
Um, API business models in ecosystems is very similar to uh, general API business models. Um, you can do direct monetization of the APIs. That's usually good for transaction-based APIs. So you sell really the API access. Uh, and there the API is the product. Um, the caller pays per call for the API. Examples are you know, email, map, voice, payment API. And then there is this indirect monetization. And that usually happens if you have another product that you want to sell. The API itself is not the thing that you want to sell. The API helps you sell your traditional product. The API helps you sell the insurance. The API helps you sell the car. The API helps you um, sell the financing. So the caller pays nothing for the API. Money is made in the traditional way. You just steer the customers through the API. Right, so an API is basically a support for marketing and sales. API is a marketing or sales channel, if you want. Right? So how does this map in this API business models? And this is from John. John created this really nice overview of API business models. You've probably seen it. It's, it's also from 2013. Uh, and, um, and here you see all the things that, that were mentioned and much, much more. You have free APIs, developer pays APIs, developer gets paid, and indirect uh, monetization. All of this applies for ecosystems as well. But what I would like to propose to extend here, um, if we talk about ecosystems, would be that you use the API as a sales channel, a sales channel in the ecosystem to steer where the customers are going. Good benefits for the API provider. Why does he do that? Um, and there we look at the flow of money and the flow of value. Uh, the API provider is not only provider of the API, he also sells regular traditional products, uh, for example, a car and insurance or, or, or data. This API provider or this product-based company also has APIs, right, becomes an API provider that way. These APIs are used by an app developer who creates this really new, cool new app uh, with the cool customer experience that we want based on the customer journey map, putting the Lego bricks together, and then in the end, we have the end user. So how does value flow here? Value flows from the product, from the product, um, all the way to the end user. That's the value um, from, from these products here, from the, um, from the traditional products, right? The end user has a benefit from using the car, from enjoying the insurance and so forth. At the same time, the end user also enjoys the benefit of using this new user experience with this app where it's really easy to buy a new thing. It's another benefit he has. And the app developer, he can build his business basically based on, on this new app that's made possible by APIs. So he was also benefiting from the whole thing. Money, on the other hand, is flowing in the other direction, right? It's flowing from the end user to the traditional product uh, company that sells the car, that sells the insurance. Uh, and, and that's probably the biggest part of it. And then there is also some money flow from the end user to the app developer. Probably the app developer finds a way to monetize this new user experience. Okay, to summarize, what have we learned here? Um, in digital ecosystems, it is very important to look at the customer. Digital ecosystems are not built around a technology or, or, um, or around APIs as such. They are built around customers and about around their needs. They are built around a customer journey that you want to support. Based on that customer journey, we then create in a second step the APIs that will support kind of digitalizing this customer journey. Then we can use these building blocks, these APIs we have created in order to build apps that just map one-on-one -on -one to the customer journey. And then we can use the API as a sales channel to create, um, to create an actual valuable business um, around these APIs that we have built. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, here's a link to API University. Um, check it out.